Given the theme of my talk today, I was going to stand here and start by saying, I am the greatest. But then I realised that some of you were actually here for my talk last year <laughs> and might disagree. Um, last year it was my second talk at, at a DOS conference and after the talk, a DOS came up to me and he's not here today so I can name him, it was John from Rotswolf and he said, Mike, your, going to your talk was like watching a movie. So I thought, oh, thank you very much. And he said, the sequel's never as good as the first one. <laughs> So, oh, thank you. So, for any of you who've seen Die Hard 3, <laughs> don't, don't say I didn't warn you, okay. Um, when I was thinking about this, this talk, um, I, someone suggested that I do the talk about leadership. Um, and I thought it was very odd. It's not very British, is it, to, to go around talking about leadership? But, but unless we're invading your country or... <laughs> Telling you what to do with the euro. Um, <laughs> apparently, apparently, the directors of studies are leaders, which was news to me. So I went into my teacher's room. I thought, I'll, I'll put this to the test. And I had a teacher in the room. I said, Magnus, quick question. Do you see me as a leader? <laughs> he looked at me and went, no. <laughs> I said, oh. I said, how do you see me? I see, he said, well, the general opinion around here is you're the guy who turns up when there's cake in the staff room <laughs> and disappears when the real work is to be done. And I, I, I suspect that if I'd proposed a talk entitled How to Eat Cake and Go Missing When the Work's to be Done, they perhaps wouldn't have accepted my, my talk this year, although I think everyone would probably have turned up for that, that talk. Um, as... My, the, the, I, I was told to, to talk about uh, leaders, and I do think we are uh, leaders in our, in our schools, uh, not only in our schools, but within um, international, uh, international house. And I, my question was, well, how can we become better leaders? And my answer is to look at the lives of people who've been successful uh, leaders and... It's my talk, so I'm going to talk about my heroes. So there. Um, we've got three people I want to talk about today. And the good thing is, these are kind of like case studies that back up everything Maureen has just said, which is my way of saying that Maureen has said everything that I'm about to say <laughs> in my talk. Um, I've got three leaders representing three different types of leadership. So Muhammad Ali to represent leadership of yourself, Abraham Lincoln to represent leadership in a time of war, and the football manager, Sir Alex Ferguson, on leading your team to victory. I apologise to the person who was expecting me to talk about Sarah Ferguson uh, today. <laughs> it's not that Fergie. I'm, so I'm sorry. Okay. Do you know who this is? Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay, exactly. Um, Cassius Clay was brought up in uh, the southern states of America during uh, the, the years of segregation. And um, if you had met Cassius Clay as a skinny 12-year-old, um, I don't think you would have been able to predict what would happen next in, in his life. But when he was 12, somebody stole his bicycle and he was so mad that he decided to train as a boxer. So when he found the people who'd stolen his bicycle, he could um, beat them up. Um, he would go on to become the heavyweight champion of the world three times. Um, it's said that in the 1970s, his face was as famous as the faces of Mickey Mouse and Jesus, is what they said. Um, he would divide public opinion in America in the 60s when he refused to fight in the Vietnam War. He's won lots of medals of honours. He, he lit the Olympic torch. Um, he's quite well known, I think, for his poetry and his good humour while he was a boxer. And you may know that he suffered from Parkinson's disease for a long time. And he's quite admired for the way, the grace in which um, he's, he's dealing with that, that disease. 
He's also a UN peace ambassador. So I thought that um, Cassius Clay, or Muhammad Ali, as he would become when he converted to Islam, would definitely have something uh, to teach us about leadership. Um, I used to watch with my dad old videos of Muhammad Ali, and I was more impressed, I think, with him out of the ring than in the ring. I was brought up in Britain listening to sportsmen doing very dull and very boring interviews on, on television. I, I don't know if you remember the Monty Python sketch where basically the, the footballer just says, I hit the ball in the back of the net, Brian. And that was the, 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 the best you could hope for from a sports star. I was amazed at the way Muhammad Ali um, would, would talk. He was very poetic, very funny. Before one fight, he said, if that chump, speaking of his opponent, if that chump even dreams of beating me, he better wake up and apologize. <laughs> and just once, I'd love to hear the England manager, Fabio Capello, say something like that about the French. <laughs> Actually, I think I'd quite like to hear Fabio Capello say that many English words in a row, but that's a, that's a different issue. My premise is that if we're going to lead other people, first we have to be able to lead ourselves. And the first tip is not flow like a butterfly, or if you're Sean, move like a fairy, I don't know. <laughs> is to be confident and be Positive. I think anyone who goes around saying, I am the greatest, probably doesn't have that many self-doubt <laughs> issues. Um, as a boy, he would tell anyone who listened that he was going to be the heavyweight champion of the world from the age of 12. He was so confident that he even took on Superman, <coughs> and he won that particular fight. Uh, but even more impressively, he also took on Elvis Presley. Um, the result of that fight is a, is a state secret, so we can't reveal who won. And um, you're probably thinking, well, yes, Mike, it's very easy to be confident if you are um, Muhammad Ali, the world's um, greatest boxer. But he wasn't the only talented boxer at the time. It was the kind of the golden age of that sport. I mean, I want you to imagine, if I put you in the ring with, for example, George Foreman, you're going... <laughs> Sorry, I always get that wrong. George Foreman. <laughs> I nearly cut that this morning. <laughs> okay. If I put you in the ring with this guy, I'm not sure you're going to be feeling very confident about your chances of getting out of the ring um, alive. Muhammad Ali faced him in 1974, and Muhammad Ali was at the end of his um, career. Um, he was getting old, he was getting slow, something I can <laughs> feel with. Um, everybody predicted that he would lose um, the fight. Um, People thought that George Foreman would be the heavyweight champion for, for life and that Muhammad Ali had no chance. So unlikely was a victory that in the dressing room before the fight, his own team were crying because they thought he was going to get badly hurt. So I would say in that situation, it's quite difficult to be confident if the whole world is saying you're going to, to lose. Muhammad Ali was slightly different, but this is what he said before the fight. Can't possibly be beat. Cassius Clay goes into the record book with Corbett, Tunney, and Braddock as another who brought off one of the great upsets in the heavyweight history. It is befitting that I leave the game just like I came in, beating a big, bad monster who knocks out everybody and no one can whoop him. That's when that little Cassius Clay from Louisville, Kentucky came up and stopped Sonny Liston, the man who annihilated Floyd Patterson twice. He was going to kill me. But he hit harder than George. His reach was longer than George. He was a better boxer than George. And I'm better now than I was 
when you saw that 22-year-old undeveloped kid running from Sunday to I'm experienced now, professional. Jaw's been broke, been lost, knocked down a couple times. Bad. Been chopping trees. I done something new for this fight. I done wrestled with an alligator. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning, throw thunder in jail. That's bad. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. Bad dude. Bad. Fast. 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 Last night, I cut the light off my bedroom, hit the switch, was in the bed before the room was dark. Incredible. Fast. Incredible. And you, George Fullman, all of you chumps are going to bow when I whoop him. All of you. I know you got him. I know you got him picked. But the man's in trouble. I'm going to show you how great I am. I've done this whole speech just to show that video in public. <laughs> Now, the next time your director asks you to do something difficult, <laughs> this is exactly what you have to say. And against all the odds, he went on and won um, the fight, shook up the world uh, <laughs> again. Um, I suppose I was thinking, what would be the equivalent of fighting George Foreman for, for um, uh, Doss's? And I imagine maybe the director comes in one day and says, oh, Mike. Well, your director probably won't say Mike unless your name's Mike. <laughs> um, listen, Mike, we've lost our biggest client. Um, three of the teachers have put in grievances against you. It doesn't happen every week. Um, the roof's leaking, coffee machine's broken. Uh, most important of all, the teacher's book for Headway Intermediate has gone missing. <laughs> and you have two days to sort this out or your fired. Um, I imagine that my response to that kind of statement would probably be limited to about two words. <laughs> and you can use your imagination as to what that would be. <laughs> I'm not sure I could turn around and say, oh, don't worry, boss, I am the greatest. Uh, um, I think, obviously, this is an exaggeration. I'm not really expecting you to go and, and talk like this in your, in your schools. I think it's also important to remember that Muhammad Ali wasn't immune to fear. Uh, he's admitted since he was absolutely terrified of, of fighting uh, George Foreman. Um, and I think we can all relate to having moments of fear working as directors of studies. That advice you're giving the teacher, are you sure that's the right advice? Are you, do you really know what you're supposed to be looking for when you go in and observe um, a lesson. It's all right, I'm not expecting you to answer now. <laughs> oh. When you're interviewing people, are you, are you certain that this is the right person for the job? There's that teacher who's got five years more experience than you. How are you going to deal with that person? There's that teacher who looks at you as if you're something they've just stepped in <laughs> on the way in. So I think there are uh, moments of, of, of fear, and I think it's very important that... Um, dealing with those moments of fear, you have to remain um, confident. I think if you start doubting yourself and your own abilities, then the game is more or less uh, lost. And I think um, you've got to remember you work for International House and you're all dosses, so you must all be very, very good. Um, but I think if you're going to go in and lead other people, then you need um, to to be positive. You can't be the Mona in the school. You have to be that confident, positive influence. So if you do have these moments of fear, it's very simple. Just stand up in your office <laughs> and shout out, I am the greatest. I'm not going to make you do it together <laughs> now, because I think on a Saturday morning you'd all kill me. So the second tip from Muhammad Ali, this reflects something that Maureen was said, is that if you're going to lead yourself, you have to have the discipline to do the stuff that nobody else likes doing, I'm afraid. I think for a boxer, that means all the training. So the hours and hours running, the skipping, um, the sparring. I think um, for us, it will be going through the paperwork, 
putting things on the computer, coming up with systems. When I was looking into this particular talk, I expected to find out that Muhammad Ali didn't have to train, for example, as much as other boxers because he was so talented. But actually, when you read about him, you find out that he was um, perhaps the hardest trainer of, of any boxer. His first trainer, Joe Martin, said that of all the kids he's trained in 30 years of training people, Muhammad Ali was the hardest um, trainer. As, as he himself said, the fight is won or lost away from the ring, behind the lines, in the gym, and out there on the road, um, long before I dance under those lights. He didn't say it in a Man Mancunian accent, but... <laughs> So I think the equivalent for us, for all of those, those hours out on the road, is tackling the, the paperwork, is taking the time to come up with systems for managing your time, managing your tasks, managing um, your, your emails, planning the week ahead, capturing all the input that comes into your office. Maybe sometimes even doing the filing. Do you find filing exciting? <laughs> Do you like to talk about filing in the pub? <laughs> I, I find that people love it if you talk to them about filing in the pub. We were having a, a nice chat in the King's Arms about it yesterday until for some reason people asked me to leave. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. I know we're, we're a bit conscious of time today, so... Um, Muhammad Ali always said that the hardest thing for him was sacrificing all the cake and, and ice cream. And I think maybe that reflects something that Maureen said about uh, maybe sometimes you have to delegate the, the fun stuff and, and do the dull and boring stuff your, yourself. The third tip, I've said this before, most of what I say in public should never be repeated, but I think this one bears repeating. And um, my lesson is that it's, it's serious, but there's no need to be um, solemn. Uh, my favorite quotation from Muhammad Ali, it's just a job. Birds fly, grass grows, waves pound the sea, I beat people up. <laughs> I think the interesting thing about all and the, the three people I'll talk about today is they were all able um, to laugh at themselves. Even Alex Ferguson apparently is able to laugh at himself. Um, and they, at Muhammad Ali, had the, the, you know, he took the time to have fun. And I think so should we. And he didn't take himself too seriously. And I think really neither, neither should we. Well, I'm not sure anyone here takes themselves too seriously, <laughs> quite frankly. He was even able to mock his own legendary confidence. Um, this is a story he told. He said, a long time ago, I was on a plane flying somewhere. I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. And when the flight attendant asked me to put it on, I told her that Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. <laughs> then she smiled at me and said, Superman doesn't need a plane either. <laughs> put, put your belt on. So. I think humor and fun are very important. I think, let's face it, being hit in the face for a living is a stressful job. <laughs> and if you don't agree with me, you can ask my ADOS. Um, I would argue that managing teachers is even more stressful than being hit in the face for a living. Um, at the very least, if you can find moments to have some fun, you will hopefully be relaxed and able to deal better with a lot of the stress that we have to, <coughs> to face. Quick example from my school recently, it was about 10 days ago, just before I was breaking up for the, the holiday, um, a teacher knocked on the door, said, Mike, I've enjoyed working here, <laughs> but I'm not coming back after Christmas. I had five days to replace, I'm sure it's something that that's, uh, uh, sounds familiar. And my five days were already full. But I managed to squeeze in five interviews. I, I did the interviews. I chose my candidate. I called everyone, got the teacher to agree to come. 
put the phone down. I thought, oh, finally, I can go on holiday. There was another knock at the door. <laughs> another teacher, Mike. <laughs> it's going to give you a bad impression of my school, isn't it? <laughs> Decided not to come back after Christmas. And so do you know what I did? I cried. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I laughed about the whole situation, yeah. Um, I think sometimes the, that is... The, 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 you know, the, the problem is if you don't laugh, you will cry. So it's important to laugh. Um, and I also think it's important to ask yourself, are your teachers having fun? Are your training sessions fun? Heaven forbid, are your teachers' meetings fun? What about the one-to-one -one contact you have? I think it is a, a legitimate thing to think about as, as a leader. Now, anybody know who this is? Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay. Like Cassius Clay, he was from um, Kentucky. But I would say that um, Abraham Lincoln probably faced more poverty in his life than the Clay family could <coughs> even um, imagine. He, was, he grew up crammed into the, the log cabin with his siblings and his parents. And in his life, it reads like a, a Shakespearean tragedy. I'm not going to ask you which tragedy and in which order. <laughs> that was yesterday. He had to stay in the cabin, actually, while his mother died over a long period from a very painful illness. He, he lost a brother, lost a sister. He lost the first love. He got so depressed as a young man that his friends actually hid sharp objects because they were so worried um, about him. And he was brought up on this on a farm and he faced kind of an unimaginable life on this, this impoverished farm. But with the love of a kind stepmother, he educated himself, he trained in law and became a celebrated lawyer on the Illinois legal circuit. Uh, but his ambition was to go into politics and it was uh, a disaster um, he, he served only one term uh, as a congressman, a two-year term, and then every other election he, he entered, and he entered a lot, he, he lost them, them all. Um, yet now, I think he's, it's fair to say he's regarded as perhaps the greatest leader the United States has ever had. Um, in 1860, he won the nomination... It's like a history lesson, isn't it? In 1860, he won the nomination for the Republican Party against all odds, and then he went on to win um, the presidential election. By the time he took his oath, seven states had already left uh, the Union. The outgoing President Buchanan would say to anyone who could catch him as he was running out of Washington that he was convinced he would be known as the last President of the United States. All the southern forts and government buildings were in the hands of the Confederates, Confederates and a, civil, a bloody civil war was inevitable. I think the world must have looked at this. Uh, well, he was a failure, quite frankly, and, and thought, oh dear, there's trouble ahead. Yet, in 1865, the war was won, the Union was slaved, the slaves uh, have been uh, emancipated, and consistently people who met him and knew him described him as the most remarkable man that they'd ever encountered. Those people who pitted themselves against him in 1860 actually fought to lead his funeral procession in, in 1865. So I thought, well, this man must have something to teach us about leadership. But, <laughs> quite frankly... If you look at this photo, if anything is going to put you off the idea of leadership, <laughs> it's this face here. Um, look at the wrinkles, look at the bags under the, <laughs> under the eyes. If this is what leadership does to your face, <laughs> I want no part of it, quite frankly. Um, Lincoln was uh, well aware that he wasn't uh, necessarily Mrs. Lincoln's prettiest child. Um, he, li <laughs> he liked to tell a story about one day he was out in the woods 
And a, a man stopped him, looked at him, raised his shotgun, and said, prepare to die. Now, Lincoln obviously shocked, said, well, well, why? And the guy said, well, my mother always told me that if I ever met anybody uglier than me, <laughs> that I should put them out of their misery and kill them on the spot. <laughs> Apparently, Lincoln says that his reply was, good Lord, if I'm uglier than you, shoot me now, was, uh, <laughs> was what he said. In, in researching this talk, I've come up with a new theory that he actually tried a few makeovers to make himself more appealing to the public. So, for example, he got rid of the beard, which I think is actually scarier than with the beard. Um, he tried to roughen up his hair, which I'm sure he's nice. For the English among you, it looks shockingly like Ken Dodd. Um, <laughs> So he grew the beard back. I'm not sure again about the haircut. That's a real photo. That's not being photoshopped. Um, then he tries something to maybe appeal to the kids. So that's <laughs> didn't really work, I don't think. Um, change of clothes. <laughs> no, maybe not. Maybe, I don't think General Grant is going to like that look. So. Maybe something that says hero. Yeah. I got Batman in again. What about a top hat and two generals? Ah. Now that's more like it. I didn't realize until looking into this how tall he was, not just because of the top hat. And there's quite a bit of research to suggest that if you want to be a leader, the only thing you need to be is tall. But I'm not tall, so I'm going to ignore that particular um, comment. Um, the I'm using Lincoln as my example of leadership in a time of war. Now, I'm not suggesting that Lucy goes out and declares war on Wall Street or uh, in Lingua, but it would be a fun year, I think, if she, <laughs> if she did. And the first tip from Lincoln is to get off one's ass and out of the office. Um, Lincoln, as president, spent less time uh, in his office than any other president. He was out and about all the time. He went to visit cabinet ministers in their offices, generals in their offices, generals in the field. Um, he even had time for a camping holiday with one of his <laughs> generals. All the time, harping on and on about the mission and the vision and, and being a presidential pain in the ass, I imagine. Um, it got to, at the beginning of the war, one of his early generals, General McClellan, uh, got so sick of Lincoln's visit that he used to hide in his office. And hands up if you've ever hidden from your director. <laughs> um, he spent most of his time, in fact, across the road in the war office reading the telegrams as they, as they came in. He was out of the office, but he still had an awful lot of work to do. He was the president during the Civil War. And for those of you who might be a bit hazy on their history, um, this is the 1860s, and this is a time before iPads <laughs> and before Twitter. <coughs> it's a time Sean refers to as the Stone Age. <laughs> um, there were no emails, no mobile phones, but he did, he did have one productivity tip that he can share. And this is his legendary top hat. Um, the, the, the myth is, and I do hope the myth is true, is that this was his portable office. And it was so tall because he actually shoved memos and reports and letters into his hat. And as he was out of the office so often, he would dip in whenever he had a few minutes. So I'm hoping that Lucy will introduce the top hat as an essential part of the, the, the DOS's armory. Um, the important thing for us is why was he out of the office so much? And he understood that if you're going to lead people, then you need to be visible. Um, at the beginning of the war, he had problems with his generals. Haven't we all had problems with our generals? Uh, one general, General Fremont, he said, his cardinal mistake is that he isolates himself and allows nobody to see him. 
and by which he does not know what is going on in the very matter he is dealing with. Now, if I were a general in the Civil War, I'd probably hide in my office as well, uh, but apparently it's not the stuff of, of leadership. Um, to put it another way, as, as Lincoln did, talking about his own travels, he said, it is important that the people know that I come among them without fear. And you know where I'm going with this. You're going to have to go and speak to your teachers. Or <laughs> um, it's also interesting, he was also very visible when he was in his office. Um, the, in those days, the White House was open. And you could just go and queue up and ask to see the president. And he, every day, would try, whilst doing all his work, go and meet all of these people who wanted um, to see him. Um, it's said that he spent 75% of his time just speaking to, to people. I think the lesson is that if you're a leader, then you do need to get out and, and preach the mission and, and talk about your, your vision. Um, so for us, I would say that means getting out of the office, just going into reception. As Maureen said this morning, I'll go and hang around in the teacher's room and see if they've got any cakes. Um, go and visit your clients, go into the, to the lessons. I think sometimes if you're going to lead people, you need to inconvenience yourself as well. I think if your school is up until nine, I think sometimes you're going to have to be there at nine o'clock. The teachers will need to see you. If your school is open on a Saturday morning, you can bet that if Lincoln were the DOS, every so often he'd be there on a Saturday to welcome the teachers as they came in. And you're all going, no way. <laughs> no way, Mike. <laughs> But I think, if, I think people do need to see their commander-in-chief in the field, and I think they will appreciate it uh, as well. Lincoln did this because he knew that you can't win a war, you can't get through difficult times on your own. And so the next tip is build the best possible team you can by building relationships with everyone in your team. Um, I think one of the best books I've read about Lincoln is a book called Team of Rivals. Um, I don't know if anyone here has, has seen uh, the book. Um, basically, it talks about Lincoln's relationship with these men, and these were his rivals for the nomination of the Republican Party in 1860. And they were all infinitely more qualified and experienced than Lincoln. By some fluke, Lincoln won the, the nomination, and uh, the, the other candidates just couldn't understand it or couldn't believe it. I mean, they'd all already arranged their, their celebrations for when their nomination would be announced. And they were quite rude about Abraham Lincoln in the build-up to the election. One of them would call him ape, Lincoln instead of Abe Lincoln. Now, I would say if I'd been in his position and I won that particular nomination and became the president, the first thing I'd do is ring up every single one of them and politely invite them to kiss my presidential ass is what, <laughs> what I would do. Um, the amazing thing about Lincoln is that he appointed these four guys into the four most important positions in, uh, in the government. Um, his genius, I suppose, was that he managed to get the best out of these people while staying in, in control. Um, he had the confidence to know that once they got to know him, that they would accept him as a, as a leader. So basically, he put his enemies into power. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go and call that kid who bullied you when you were eight years old and invite him over to be your ADOS. But I think he knew that at that time, the country was, was struggling so much, they needed the best people and not necessarily 
is friends or uh, yes, yes men. Um, they, at the beginning, however, it seemed like a stupid decision because they all arrived in Washington rubbing their hands, sure that they would be able to take over. And I'm sure we've all had that experience in our own teacher's room as the, the vultures sit there. We'll, we'll give this guy a few months and then we'll be the, the DOS. Um, the amazing thing is, as Goodwin, who wrote the book, says, they came to power thinking Lincoln was rather unexceptional and ended up believing that he was as near a perfect man as anyone they'd ever met. My question was, well, how the hell did he do that? <laughs> because that would be an interesting lesson. Um, one thing he did was he talked to them often. Donald T. Phillips, who wrote the book about Lincoln, said, conversation was the most important aspect of Lincoln's leadership style. He had constant one-to-one -one meetings with his staff, and I think so, so should we. An interesting thing was he would avoid orders. He would invite people to do things or encourage them to do things rather than telling them to do things. Um, he summed this up a lot earlier in a speech he gave in 1842, and he said, I'll read the whole thing, it's quite interesting. When the conduct of man is designed to be influenced, kind, unassuming persuasion should ever be adopted. It is an old and true maxim that a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. And so with men, convince him you are his sincere friend, therein is a drop of honey that catches his heart, which is the great high road to his reason, and you will uh, find but little trouble in convincing him of the justice of your cause. And however, if you try to coerce somebody, according to Lincoln, you shall no more be able to reach him than to puncture the shell of a tortoise with a rice straw. Now, I don't know how many of you who have tried to puncture the shell of a tortoise with a rice straw. I gave it a go in Greenwich Park yesterday, and it's quite difficult. So, um, One example of this drop of honey was uh, one member of his government, government, Salmon Chase, was very resistant to the idea of paper money. Lincoln wanted paper money to be introduced, and he could have ordered Salmon Chase to do it, but um, this is going back to the delegation things that we've spoken about today. So he went into a meeting with Salmon Chase, and Salmon Chase said, no way, we're not having paper money. No way. 20 minutes later, he left the office saying, Abe, the best idea I've ever heard. You leave it to me. And Lincoln didn't have to do anything else. Paper money was produced instantly. Now, if you're interested in what the drop of honey is, if you go back and look at those first dollar bills, it's not Abraham Lincoln's face on the dollar bill, it's Salmon Chase's face on the dollar bill. So there is always a way of persuading someone to do what you want them to do. Another thing he did was thank people. Um, he was always writing letters, especially to his generals. After the Battle of Vicksburg, he wrote a letter, letter to General Grant, and Lincoln and Grant had had a disagreement on the tactics to be used, but they went with Grant's tactics, and the battle was won, and he wrote the following. I write this now as a grateful acknowledgement for the almost inestimable service you have done this country. I now wish to make this personal acknowledgement that you were right and I was wrong. Kiss, kiss, Abe. No. Uh, the, last, the, the last bit's not true. So when, when did you last write a thank you note to someone? And dare I say it, when did you last write a thank you note to one of your teachers? I will <laughs> hide behind here. Um, again, reflecting something that's already been said today, he knew that as the leader he had to take the blame for all the problems and pass on the praise to other people. During his last speech before his assassination, um, he didn't do many speeches after his assassination, I have to say, so let's just call it his last speech. Um, 
he stood, he stood in front of the cr a crowd outside the White House and he said, I am the greatest. No, he didn't say I'm the greatest. He said, no part of the honor for the plan or execution is mine. To General Grant, his officers and brave men all belongs. So it's a simple message, just pass on the praise for what goes, goes right. The last tip for Lincoln <laughs> is to be trustworthy. I think it's crucial, especially in difficult times, that people know that what you say you will do and that, that you are following your values and your beliefs. Um, and I think that's what trustworthy means. I think it means to stick to your values. And maybe when, th when times are difficult, that's the moment where you think, well, maybe I'll just ignore this particular value that I have. And um, I think Lincoln teaches that in times of war, you should stick to your principles. He was very lenient by nature, and he had um, faced a lot of resistance to this leniency. People wanted him to be much stricter. But he actually issued more pardons than any other president. One example was close to home. His sons, Willie and Ted, and I think this says more about the Lincoln household than it does about anything else, sentenced their soldier doll, Jack, to death for falling asleep on guard duty. And Lincoln, immediately taking a piece of executive mansion stationery, wrote, the doll Jack is pardoned by order of the president, A. Lincoln. Um, it wasn't just Soldier Jack that benefited. Um, I, I think um, as leaders, we need to be congruent. He stuck to his guns and, and he issued the pardons. And in his last inaugural address, he, he spoke about the reconstruction with um, malice towards none and charity um, for all. So he was consistent throughout um, the war. I think like Lincoln, we too should try to be trustworthy. Um, lastly, because we're running out of time, this is the bit all you Liverpool and Leeds fans have been waiting for. Um, Lincoln is almost as great as my last hero, Sir Alex Ferguson, manager of Manchester United. I must say that since planning this talk, Manchester United have lost 6-1 to Manchester City. <laughs> we were knocked out of the Champions League by a Swiss team. <laughs> and I was thinking about changing my last example. But um, his record is exceptional and surely has something um, to teach us. Uh, just because I'm a United fan, I'll read through what he's won. And Nick will enjoy this especially. Um, at Aberdeen, he won three league titles and one European Cup Winners' Cup. At United, so far, he's won 12 Premier Leagues, five FA Cups, four League Cups, ten Charity Shields, two Champions League, one European Cup Winners' Cup, one Intercontinental Cup, one FIFA World Club Cup, and a partridge in a pantry. Um, he's a, got a knighthood. He's had a stand named after him. So I thought he could maybe teach us something about success, about leading a team um, to victory. And his first tip is you can win things with kids. Um, a few years ago, uh, a famous TV uh, pundit looked at the United team after some experienced teachers had left and been replaced with young kids, inexperienced players, and he famously said, you're knowing nothing with kids. He was Scottish, by the way, if you didn't recognize that accent. <laughs> and, um, however, United went on that year to win the, the league, so there. Um, now, I mean, I don't want to be silly about it. He didn't <coughs> use actual children. <laughs> and he didn't ignore the experienced players. Even now, um, I don't know if you know the player Ryan Giggs, um, he's my age, and for anyone who's not sure, he's over 30. Um, and he is still scoring in the Premiership now, at my age. And if you read the papers, he's scoring just about everywhere else <laughs> as well. 
I'll probably get sued for that now. So. Um, but I think Ferguson has consistently not relied only on age and experience. Um, he's ruthless in getting rid of players if he thinks they've lost their hunger. And he will then replace them with inexperienced young players. And the important thing to remember is that even when doing that, he continues um, to win. And I think I would say we perhaps want the same in our schools. If I've got a choice between two candidates, one's got the delta, years of experience, but I get the impression that they've lost their energy, enthusiasm, desire, and then I have someone who's just finished their CELTA but seems very enthusiastic. I, I, for me, there's no, it's an easy choice to make. I'll go with the, the CELTA, a newly qualified teacher, every time. Um, I mean, I think Trevor said it on Thursday that your new teachers can bring a lot of enthusiasm and desire to, to the school. So, I mean, we'd all love a team of Ryan Giggses, if that's the plural of gigs. Uh, you know, people who are, are experienced, are talented, and still hungry. But I think if you can't get the experience, um, it, you can still win things with, with kids. Um, Ferguson, however, is no spring chicken. He celebrated his 70th birthday last week. He's had consistent success in 25 years. He's created five teams, winning teams. And I think he's been able to do that because he's been happy to change it all. And um, uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> He's holding a sign up at me here saying, shut up. No, <laughs> no. There's oh, there's three signs to go. Okay. <laughs> Ten minutes, good. Um, I think he instinctively knows what the, the business guru, Marshall Goldsmith, says, what got you here won't get you there. Um, he's had to deal with a lot of changes. The, the rules of the game have changed. The stadium have changed. The fans have changed. The, there's so much more money now. There's the Premier League, Champions League, Sky TV. And he's adapted to all of those changes. He's also been an instigator of change as well. So he's uh, introduced a whole new training complex for the team. Um, very interesting, he says that one of the key factors in, in his success is that he learned to delegate at an early age. And he always says that's one of the key reasons he's been successful. Um, apparently he's even cooled his legendary temper and um, he's changed the way he trains people, etc. Um, I think we've had a similar situation in Milan where I work. Um, if I look at the last six years, we've gone from a school with very few kids to, to hundreds of kids. We've had a, a summer camp, we've gone from a closed Cambridge centre to an open centre, from having mostly native teachers to, to mostly non-native um, teachers. So we've had to, and, and, and let's not talk about the technology that's come in, we've had to struggle with a lot of those changes and we're still struggling with, with some of them. And, but I think I'm quite proud that we've also driven some of those and helped push them, them through. I don't want to repeat what's been said in the last few days, but I think it's very important that we still come to events like this and learn what's new, what's, what's on Twitter, what's going to be the new Twitter, what's, what the hell is dogma, and should I be using it? But we should at least be open to the idea that there, there might be things out there that can uh, help us um, change our schools. The last tip of the day... Um, is to take time to observe, reflect, and think. Ferguson once advised um, Tony Blair. So I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but let's move on. He said, to be successful as a manager, you have to have vacuums where you can think to yourself. I've never tried thinking to anybody else, but... <laughs> um, Vacuums where you can think to yourself, it's important to get that time in your life where you have space, 
where you can think to yourself, he's doing it again, and think about what you are going to do. Now, this isn't something Ferguson just said. I have proof. Here is a photo where he is clearly thinking to himself. <laughs> so, now, to do that, you need to find the time to think. So, one of the things you can do is you can say no. But maybe we're going to learn more about saying no later. And I don't know whether Nick can help us with the body language there. I'm not sure that the word he's saying there is actually no. <laughs> this is great because now I don't have to talk about this because Maureen has spoken this morning about it. But it's really important um, to, to give stuff to other people. And it's interesting that pretty much everything Maureen has said, these three people applied them in their, their lives. Ferguson says, delegate so you can observe what is going on around you. Trust others to do their jobs while standing back to consider the quality of what is being done and the direction in which things are going. That's your, that's your job as, as a leader. So, um, I won't talk any more about delegation. We've done enough on that. So, let's say you get the time. What are you supposed to do with the time? Um, I was surprised to find that Ferguson spends a lot of his time reading, and I was very pleased to hear him talk about A Team of Rivals, the book I mentioned before about Abraham Lincoln, and that he, he ranks it as one of his favorite books. Um, he used that book as then a springboard to go and study the American Civil War, and he even went as far as um, borrowing some CDs from Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, there's a lot of ex-Prime Ministers here, and he, he, in his car he would listen to his CDs. There were 48 CDs in this particular collection. So, I think he delegates an awful lot <laughs> if he's got time. <laughs> and it might explain why we lost 3-0 to Newcastle <laughs> only three days ago. Um, apparently, he says, I can learn a lot about the art of team building and management from all sorts of places. It's all about managing people and relationships in the end. There's more to it, though. I think you need to take time to, to study um, your school, to observe what's going on um, in your school. And I don't just mean classroom observation. I think um, Maureen's point is very important, that you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of everyone in your team. It's something Ferguson famously did with a, a player called Eric Cantona, who'd had a string of problems with previous managers. Um, but Ferguson took the time to watch him, to speak to him, to understand him, and managed to get so much out of this player that he was re this player was recently voted the best ever player for Manchester United. Eric Cantona gives all the credit to Alex Ferguson. He said that Ferguson gave me the freedom to be involved completely and not feel in jail. That's psychology man to man. Ferguson scoffs at the idea of hiring a psychologist for the team. He says, that's my job, that to know the team. And I think it's the same for us as well. So I would encourage you to observe your teachers, meet them regularly on a one-to-one -one basis, <laughs> listen to them. Before Sean holds up <laughs> signs that say you're overrunning, I, I will leave it there. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for letting me indulge my passions for, for these three heroes. I'm going to leave you with one quick bonus lesson from Alex Ferguson. It's a bit of bad news. Um, apparently, being a leader is bloody hard work. Um, Ferguson famously arrives at 6 a.m. every morning and is the last to leave. Um, as one observer said, Alex Ferguson puts in as much mental and physical effort as you can possibly have. One year, he forgot it was Christmas, and his wife <laughs> received a Christmas card, a recycled Christmas card, with a cheque inside. <laughs> 
which she then ripped up. Um, he does have the time for some hobbies, but I think um, we don't want to have too much uh, free time. I'm sure you would agree with that. I mean, uh, Lincoln, too, he knew the importance of getting away from, from things. He actually went to the theatre a hundred times as president, and, well, look where that got him. <laughs> Shot. So, it's better to work. I think <laughs> if... If you're going to be a leader, it's difficult, I think, to get a work-life balance. Um, I'd say it's impossible, really. Um, the key, of course, is that Ferguson, Lincoln and Ali, all three of them really loved doing what they do. And I hope that you all love being dosses as well. Now I will stop. Thank you very much.